I'm uh, Michael Lambert, a fellow in social inequalities here at the Department of Sociology in Lancaster University and the engagement lead for the Centre for Alternatives to Social and Economic Inequalities. And so I'm here today asking about the research that's been done in the department and showcasing its relationship to inequalities. So can I begin by asking, uh, who are you? Yeah. Uh, I'm Jasmine Flutter Johan. I'm a senior lecturer here in sociology at Lancaster, um, and I'm also a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow. And what do you do? A couple of different things. Right now, the main thing that I'm doing is I'm leading a research project, uh, which is that UKRI funded project, uh, Food Security for Equitable Futures. Um, I work on measurement and the social causes and consequences of inequalities. Um, and really that focuses on primarily the global south, not exclusively, but primarily looking at health inequalities. And I have two main streams of research uh, within that. So one of them focuses on infertility and reproductive justice. Um, essentially the idea of globally, when we think about infertility, when we try to measure infertility, who gets left out globally and why, with particular focus on sort of structural inequalities and in, in determining who gets left out of that picture. Uh, and the second stream, which is my primary focus right now, is food insecurity during childhood and adolescence. So when I'm talking about food insecurity, um, building from the UN's definition of food insecurity, uh, we're really talking about difficulties accessing enough safe and nutritious food to support a healthy life. Um, so I'm really interested in sort of social causes and consequences and long-term impacts of food insecurity over the life course. No, that's fantastic. I mean, in terms as well, you can see the ramifications of what you're doing, particularly in a global context of, you know, the climate emergency, how that has a real sort of uh, resonance and, and relevance. And so if that's what you do, how do you go about your research and understanding these uh, sort of very significant and large structural issues? Uh, broadly speaking, I'd say I'm a mixed methods researcher, uh, but more focused on the quantitative than the qualitative end of things. Um, so a lot of what I do is applying statistical methods to secondary survey data sources. So what I mean by that is surveys that have been collected by other teams. I take their data and I analyze those data um, in order to be able to answer questions about inequalities. Uh, but I do also do some primary data collection. So I collect uh, mainly qualitative interview data, um, which really is, I think, an important complement to some of the statistical analysis and, and allows people to sort of express their lived experiences of inequalities in their own words. Oh, definitely. And then, you talked about inequalities a lot already and how your work intersects with that as kind of a, a key conceptual issue. So can you give me an example of how the research that you do uh, kind of intersects with this idea of inequalities and sort of um, gets under the skin both of understanding it, but also then thinking about providing uh, alternatives as a consequence as well, that kind of broader social impact? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll um, tell you a little bit more about the Food Security for Equitable Futures project, which is uh, my main focus right now. Uh, so that project is looking at Ethiopia, India, Peru, and Vietnam, and looking at food insecurity, particularly for children and adolescents, but also more broadly for households and sort of what's happening within households. Um, so there are sort of three core things I'm interested in there. The first is who's most at risk of food insecurity. And when I say that, I mean both in terms of sociodemographics, which households are most at risk, but also within households. Are there inequalities within households and who has access to food resources? Um, so a lot of that question I'm answering through analyzing secondary data. I've got a great team here at Lancaster and a, a team more broadly working on this project. Um, so we're analyzing data called Young Lives, uh, which is a longitudinal study of childhood poverty. Um, and we're analyzing their data to answer that question. I'm also really interested, the second question is on how we can better measure inequalities. So a lot of when we think about food insecurity, a lot of the way that we measure it, especially in surveys, focuses on households, but we know, especially from qualitative literature, we know that there are inequalities playing out in households as well. So I'm quite interested in doing some future data collection, and that's part of this project. In the coming two to three years, we'll be doing some primary data collection um, to unpack that a little bit more and understand how we can better measure inequalities within households. And then the third big question in the project is, uh, is food insecurity, or probably more like how is food insecurity um, tied to other inequalities? Um, so I'll just give you a specific example, which is educational outcomes. Uh, so we've done some previous work, uh, my collaborators on this project and I, um, on food insecurity and educational outcomes, really focusing particularly on learning outcomes. Um, and when children experience food insecurity and for how long. So sort of timing of food insecurity and how that might matter for learning outcomes. 
Um, so what we found is that food insecurity is negatively associated with children's learning across a range of learning domains. But actually, interesting, the timing, interestingly, the timing really matters. Um, so generally, earlier is worse. You're worse off being food insecure at age five than age 12. But also, a short spell is less harmful than a long spell. And some recovery might be possible. Um, and interestingly, we also found that recovery was a little bit different in different domains. So for something like reading, where once you have the foundational skills, you might be able to miss something, but then come back and catch up. Uh, food insecurity was a little bit less impactful than for something like maths, where each week, each month is building on things that you've learned in previous weeks and months. So the more cumulative that curriculum is, the more difficult it is to recover from particularly early food insecurity. So the next thing we'd like to do is using those Young Lives data, um, continue to look at impacts on schooling, particularly thinking about things like schooling trajectories. Do you drop out of school? When do you drop out of school? Um, and then we'll also be doing some qualitative data collection and a little further into the future in the project, also collecting some survey data on food insecurity. So can I ask about a little bit about the case studies that you've chosen, about why uh, those countries uh, were sort of more uh, appropriate for the kind of research that you're doing, but then also about the kinds of um, findings that you've come across with about how they compare across the different study sites in terms of sort of commonalities and then perhaps differences uh, among them. Yeah, so part of that choice was uh, purely pragmatic because Young Lives focuses on those four countries. Oh, okay. So if I wanted to be able to look at the Young Lives data, those were the four countries I was going to be looking at. Um, but obviously, Young Lives chose those countries strategically as well, right? So they're countries that are in different regions of the world. They're all in the global south, but they have in some ways quite different family structures, quite different structures of inequality, quite different experiences of things like food insecurity, um, as well as different policy contexts as well. So for example, in India, we see uh, India has the largest school feeding program in the world, um, which offers a really important opportunity to understand how things like school feeding programs can help children uh, to sort of uh, mitigate the effects of food insecurity, prevent food insecurity. And so already, I mean, you've you've hinted a lot of this, but um, can I ask about the kinds of organizations and institutions that you work with as part of this research, both in terms of perhaps um, groups that you're disseminating, engaging with, but those perhaps in local areas and communities where you're also working alongside and trying to foment some of this understanding into, into meaningful change? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm really lucky to have an absolutely brilliant group of stakeholders involved in this project. Um, they've been sharing their expertise, sharing their time, which has been fantastic. Um, my project team includes not only our group here at Lancaster, but also Elizabeth Taurino, who's at Imperial College London, um, and Sukumar Prelakal, who's at IIT Kanpur. Um, so he is my primary partner in India, um, who's going to be leading some of the qualitative data collection in the coming next two years. Um, but additionally, we're working with some project partners who are operating as stakeholders. Um, so for example, members of the Young Lives team have been hugely helpful in working with the Young Lives data, uh, the World Food Program, International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, Water Aid India, and, and many others as well. Um, so we're really grateful to have such fantastic stakeholders involved in the project. But it sounds from what you're saying in terms of the kinds of findings that you've uh, come across, the way in which you've collected your information and how you've assembled it all, that there is a way that this has almost a, a natural resonance in taking these forms of evidence to these kinds of organisations, institutions and, and policy communities and being able to have uh, a transformative impact as well. That's definitely the hope, yeah, and we're, we're really hoping to work as well. I've got a fantastic uh, project administrator who is doing a lot of public outreach work, uh, working on our website or social media presence, so we're hoping as well to have a lot of public engagement in the project. Um, but also, yeah, I think it's the kind of work that is highly policy relevant, and by working with the partners that we're working uh, on, we're hoping that, you know, the work will be actually valuable and helpful to them. And you know, we go to them with the work as it's ongoing and, and say, is this, you know, is this the sort of evidence that you're looking for? What else can we do that would be helpful evidence that you're looking for? So hopefully sort of a mutual, a mutually beneficial uh, relationship there. So my final thing is people are going to be interested because it's a very significant research project. Where can we find out more information? Where, where are the website? What's the social media profile? Where are we going to look to find out and learn more? 
so we have a WordPress site through Lancaster University uh, that is Food Security for Equitable Futures. Uh, we are also on Twitter at food underscore equity. Um, I'm on Twitter at jflitterjohan1. Um, and you can find the whole project's team information uh, there through my Twitter page. Perfect.